forward to our conversation, I'm going to start it off by telling you a little bit about an investigation we published this week. Um, but to preface it, I'm going to, I'm going to show you a precious document I'm holding in my hands from Jackson County. And what this is, is a brand new policy enacted by the Board of Commissioners two weeks ago to establish policies for approval and opening of closed session minutes. Which is to say that when a local government board goes into closed session to discuss often a sensitive matter, they're required to keep minutes, and then down the road they're required to release those minutes under certain circumstances to the public. Uh, by my reading, Jackson has adopted a very good policy in this regard that is proactive. It instructs county staff to, on a regular basis, review closed session minutes and decide which ones can go to the public so that we can learn what was discussed behind closed doors about our local government. So, uh, bravo to Jackson County, and, and we're always excited to see this sort of thing happen. Uh, because what we found in researching closed sessions around Western North Carolina was a wide variety of practices about holding the meetings themselves and about which meetings would eventually go public. That is, which meetings would have their minutes released to the public. To begin with, in about the 17 counties where we could get the numbers, we found that last year a total of 303 closed sessions were held. Um, of those, 75% uh, remain sealed. That is, the minutes are not available. We, we requested that all that could be unsealed be unsealed. Uh, some of those minutes will never be released to the public because by law they cannot be. There are certain personnel matters, there are certain confidential legal, um, health care, and, and other matters that under state law cannot be released. However, with some other issues, boards have some discretion and sometimes some obligation to release minutes once doing so would not frustrate the purpose of the closed session. That's what the law says. We found that <coughs> counties uh, vary substantially in the number of closed sessions they hold. Uh, in Western North Carolina, the county with the most closed sessions last year was Henderson. They held 52 closed sessions. Um, and in Mitchell County, the lowest number, who can guess? Six. Zero. <laughs> Yancey County held only two. Here in Jackson, there were 23 that were held, kind of an average number. Where we're from in Buncombe, surprisingly, only 16 were held. And our investigation looked into some of the reasons that those numbers vary. And you can find uh, all the detail you'd like on those issues in our report at carolinapublicpress.org. Uh, we found there are four main reasons that county boards go into closed session. You probably hear about them if you follow civic matters closely. The four main ones are to discuss personnel issues, economic development incentives, legal matters, attorney-client privilege, and property acquisition, bidding on property that counties are thinking about purchasing. And uh, that held pretty consistent across the board. We did find in Henderson that almost half of the meetings were about giving tax incentives to businesses. They do that very aggressively in Henderson, and um, they don't make any bones about it. They all the commissioners, the commissioners are unanimous in their belief that it's a good idea. And so they tout these programs publicly, but while they're negotiating them with various companies that are thinking about expanding in the county, they use the clause in the state law that allows them to keep that discussion private to protect their negotiating position. Importantly, once those tax incentive deals go through, the minutes of those meetings go public. So we were able to determine the calculus that the commissioners in Henderson were making when they decided to meet in secret to talk about this. We found out what other locales Henderson County was competing with for business. Sometimes it was other communities in North Carolina, sometimes communities elsewhere in the states, and oftentimes it was a multinational saying, we, we could set up shop in Europe, we could set up shop in Asia. If we're going to set up shop in Henderson, we're going to need some tax credits. So we learned a lot about the inner workings of what's often a controversial set of policies around these issues by asking for the records and getting some of them released. And that was heartening. Um, and 
to bring it back to Jackson, all the more heartening to see the new policy here. Um, it looks like progress to us, and it gives citizens the opportunity to see more at records and closed sessions and to see them more often. Um, so with that as a departure point, we're going to spend the rest of our half hour talking about what's good and bad in regard to open government in North Carolina, with some focus on the western part, but also looking at statewide issues. And to do that, uh, look at the broader frame. Jonathan's going to speak with us for about five minutes. So uh, first, uh, thank you all for having me, and I've, I've never missed an opportunity to um, uh, promote our mobile application that we have on Open Government North Carolina. Uh, Open Government Coalition has a, an app you can download if you, and that uh, tells you how the Sunshine Laws work are supposed to work, whether you're on the government side or a, um, an information seeker. It'll give you information that'll be helpful. So all you can do is search uh, North Carolina Sunshine in your uh, in your app store, and you should be able to find. So as far as um, you know, issues that across uh, the state or even Western North Carolina, I, I, I think that uh, John's reporting it solidified what uh, on, on open meetings uh, solidified what a lot of us who, who deal with multiple uh, counties know, and that's that there is a significant inconsistency from one community to another in how um, the, the the transparency policies are in effect. We can uh, ask for the same record from uh, all 100 counties, and we very well may get 100 different responses as to whether or not this is a record that should be released, whether it's one that can be released, or there's any fault to it, and it's immediately you know, handed over. And so that lack of consistency is uh, one of the problems that, that uh, I see on a regular basis. The, um, you know, John's project on closed meeting minutes reminds me of a situation that we had up in uh, Surrey County, uh, which where uh, the county commissioners had held uh, a series of closed sessions uh, for over a three-year period and never unsealed any of their closed session minutes. Uh, when uh, all the commissioners were Republican, so the local Democrats said, we'd like to see the minutes from these closed sessions, uh, they said, we don't, we don't know what to do here. And it took them two or three months to figure out how to craft a policy like what Jackson County sounds like they agree. And so it's, it's good to hear that we have uh, communities up here that are thinking about that. Uh, it is important that those minutes be released on a regular basis. The, um, I'll tell you two sort of quick stories in, in, um, about open meetings in Western North Carolina. Uh, one, uh, this came up about 15, 16 months ago. One of the more egregious stories I've heard in my short time with the North Carolina Open Government Coalition, I've been there for two years, is uh, happened in uh, Cherokee County, where the Murphy Airport Authority had not held an open meeting in 26 years. <laughs> they hadn't kept any minutes. Uh, basically, uh, the airport authority, where they were all guys who worked out at the airport or a few planes or whatever, and uh, they would have their meetings over breakfast. Mm -hmm. and, and for 26 years, that's how they did business. That's appalling. Uh, and we laugh at it, but it's, you know, it's, it's appalling. Uh, the other story is more recent. Uh, this has popped up in the last couple months, uh, and where um, the, the town of Hildebrand, which is in Burke County, um, has decided to demolish a beautiful old building, uh, not uh, a courthouse, but a school. And apparently that decision was made by uh, town council members uh, meeting outside of uh, open meetings. Now they had an open meeting where they, they formally voted on it, but there were never any closed sessions that gave people notice that we were, we we're getting together to demolish this building. Uh, that's been challenged. Uh, by some, some attorneys representing preservationists and it's, it's been put on hold uh, because there's no parent of the meetings law. Matters. So the meetings law is important because it does give us access to where our government officials go. I think I'm probably over my five minutes and I haven't even got oh, to the statewide issues. Please. Um, I have um, sort of uh, uh, two statewide issues that I have been talking to people about as much as I can. Uh, the first is uh, the adoption of body cameras by police departments. Uh, we're seeing a rapid adoption of, of uh, this new technology by police departments all across the country and here in North Carolina. Uh, these are important tools for, for transparency purposes and they're sold to local communities on the idea that these are going to hold our officers accountable. And I'm, I'm generally a pro law enforcement guy. I used to work as a prosecutor. I know that they're doing excellent work. Uh, but there are times where uh, that camera is going to serve as 
invaluable evidence in determining whether or not an officer behaved uh, the way that we expect them to. And the, um, the reason that this is a, an open government issue is because the first police department in North Carolina to adopt body cameras on a widespread scale was the city of Greensboro. And when the city of Greensboro drafted a policy on how they were going to handle their uh, body cameras, they wrote in their policy that the purpose of these body cameras is, you know, first and foremost to collect evidence when an officer uh, is, is doing his work. Second primary purpose is to evaluate the officer's behavior for training purposes or for uh, potential uh, disciplinary purposes. They classified it as a personnel document. Now, I have ne we have not seen this in any other state. Every state has personnel privacy protections, like North Carolina. But this is the first state where this has happened, the first large police department where this happened. Well, when the smaller police departments go about uh, looking at what kind of policy that they're going to create when they adopt a body camera, what do you think they do? They just look at the city of Greensboro. And so this is becoming a problem all across the state. That's a problem because once a document is a personnel document, it cannot be released. It moves from, uh, there's a law enforcement exception under the um, public records law that gives law enforcement a wide discretion to withhold documents. But that can be, uh, but it's, it's that discretion. They can choose to release a document when they need to and say uh, a city council could overrule the police chief and determine that this document needs to be released for the sake of um, the community uh, maintaining trust in the police department. Once it's classified as a personnel document, it shifts from a may release to a cannot release. And so that's a significant problem. We've already had two police shootings in Greensboro. Um, there's no question that officers did the correct thing in both cases, but those videos are not available to the public to determine whether, to determine that for themselves. And that's one of the reasons we're being told that these are, um, these body cameras are necessary. And so we need to see a change, uh, probably at the legislature, uh, either, either from the legislature or in the courts, we need some clarity as far as uh, what kind of records these are. Um, the public is overwhelmingly in support of body cameras. The Elon poll just did, uh, released some results last week that showed that 90% of North Carolinians want to see police departments using body cameras. 64% uh, of North Carolinians want to see these be accessible to the public. And so I think it's important that we make that change and we make it soon. Um, the other issue that we've been dealing with uh, quite a bit uh, is sort of related, and that's on the, on the personnel uh, protections. Uh, the um, public records law doesn't actually have an exception for personnel. What happens is the General Assembly has created 10 different personnel statutes, and each of those exempt those records from the public records law. So it's a separate part of the law you have to go look at. And the personnel law, uh, it, it protects a large chunk of information that government agencies have about their employees. The, um, one of the problems that we're seeing is, uh, well, sorry, um, one of the things that it does, it's, it, it, there's, seven, there's several specific things that it says, even though we have these privacy protections, these things need to be released. That's the age of the employee, the date that they were hired, their name, um, when, uh, when they were last promoted, demoted, uh, suspended, and if they were fired, there's a letter that's supposed to exist that uh, explains why they were fired. It's, it's uh, not only a letter to the employee, but the, the letter is a public record. What we're seeing is that um, there's some really high profile cases across the state, and, and in some ways it interacts with the open meetings law, where uh, high level employees are being released from their duties. Um, and the, the, there's an example, uh, all three of the examples I'm thinking of are school superintendents, uh, one in Wilmington, one in Charlotte, and one in Burlington. And in each case, a school board met behind closed doors with the superintendent, comes out of closed doors, and announces the superintendent is resigning for uh, one reason or another, it's you know, to go take care of mom or something like that, and uh, we're giving them a large severance package. And, uh, there's no explanation as to what went wrong or why uh, you know, 200 plus thousand dollars of taxpayer money is being spent. And so um, that's, that's being challenged uh, uh, in uh, the Court of Appeals right now under the Open Meetings Law that the minutes from those meetings should be public by the Burlington Times News. Uh, and so that, that's going to be an interesting case to follow over the next 
uh, year or so. Thank you, Jonathan. And now Quentin's going to uh, tell us some stories from the trenches. Uh, that is uh, some anecdotes and some hard facts about uh, ways she's encountered openness and lack thereof in her reporting. So a lot of y'all know, and that's important if you're a local reporter, when I hear of the airport authorities been meeting for 22 decades illegally, I want to know where the newspapers are. I mean, that's what I want to know is what was the charity scout. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's not to to be harsh particularly, but in a way it is. That's our jobs. And I, when I was starting out in Franklin in 1992, and we had a writing coach come in, it came in, and I think the Boston Globe, Bill Stasiowski, the company brought it in. And I remember him saying, we can use paper to the foot soldiers. Well, they, they're not there. Um, and the ones who are there, the people who are choosing to go journalism, often are untrained, inexperienced, and they, often are afraid of making the people they cover not like them. And that takes time. I mean, that that takes age and maturity to the point where you say it's okay if they're not like them. That's just growing up. But these people are very young. Journalism is not necessarily where you're going to go if you're the brightest person in your class right now. And, it, you know, it's just all doom and gloom. And put in a plug for Andy. Andy and I were colleagues, the actual citizen. This is the future. I don't know if her business model, which is a nonprofit, is the future. I don't know. I don't know. So, but it's going to be bright people like this coming up with different ways to cover the news. But Angie and John are sitting in action. Murphy is on the other side of the world. And that meanwhile, the airport authority is meeting and leaving. And nobody's asking why. I, it's just, it boggles the imagination that the reporters, some editor, or the publisher, did not realize that an airport authority is a subgroup of the county commissioners and therefore subject to the maintenance law. Um, and the biggest problem with weekly newspapers right now is just the aggression out there. You have some good people, but if you're really good, you're going to go to a daily newspaper. And you're going to, you know, you're going to be a star. You're going to sound silver, Murphy, or whatever. You're going to move on. And what I learned in the same company was that they don't want experience reporters. They want you to either become an editor or move out. And that's kind of a side, and I don't want to rattle them too much. I, let me get really quick to my experiences. Jackson County is a dream. And I'm not just saying that because I have a commissioner, a former commissioner. I mean, you're a new DOT board member, Jack Dev, I'm there in the back. They're, they're wonderful. This is a sophisticated county with a university in it and a lot of government people. And it's really pretty easy. I have a personal relationship with the people I cover. Um, I think they understand me and I understand them. If they push me, I'm going to push back. If they shoot straight with me, I'm going to shoot straight with them. We're all going to get along and they're really pretty good. As far as I know, I have not had a illegal close meeting of the Jackson County Board of Commissioners occur in the last four years that I've covered, to the best of my knowledge. And I, I have no reason to think otherwise. I may not always agree that they need to go into closed session. I think they need to reasons to be transparent, not reasons to go behind the door. But really, I don't think I've ever had that thought. Cherokee is my nightmare. It is every people's nightmare. That is not the Cherokee people. They are not the people. They are a sovereign nation. They're not subject to state laws. And that means they can just ban you. They don't like what you do. One of my most embarrassing moments occurred with Jack. We were sitting in a dual meeting at the Jackson County Board of Commissioners and Tribal Council <coughs> five years ago. And one of the tribal council members said, basically, I don't know what this is written about. I'm, I may be twist this a little bit. And I said, well, I can't not write about it. It's a public meeting. And they didn't want a public meeting. The reason why is they own their own newspaper. They own the paper. They dictate what's covered. One quick point, and I'll shut up. The biggest problem I'm experiencing, and this is the difference between working for the Asheville Citizen Times and you try it out. I'm the investigative reporter for the Asheville Citizen Times, and I'm a weekly newspaper in Silver, North Carolina. That's spelled S Y L V A, and you put in a public records request like I did with the Wildlife Resources Commission, and has sat there since January. They won't even acknowledge that I exist. And in locally, and I'm not doing this here, Jackson's the one who truly is. You can shame someone. It's very hard to shame a bureaucracy in Raleigh. 
and we can push the tell you they're going to charge money now. And that's under Governor Reports administration. I believe that's correct. Um, they now charge you if you say I want something that's a little more complicated than how we going to charge. I think John said $45 an hour on something. I work for little paper. They're not going to pay that money. They don't have that money. And I don't have a lawyer behind me where I can get them to pick up the phone like an ad company for actual citizen and say, oh, by the way, we're going to sue you and we mean it if you don't produce the records. So you have to be, you know, I try not to abuse the public records law because I see it on one level. Um, you see individuals who just keep requesting information and they really piss off the administration and then they make it harder for everybody. Um, you need to have a good reason for why you're asking for something. It needs to show up in print if you're a reporter. That's really my, I just kind of skipped around. Um, but if, if you don't have reporters on the ground, you know what they're doing? Mm -hmm. It's not going to, all this stuff about the laws and everything, it doesn't matter. I mean, somebody's got to be asking their for authority. Why are you behind? Why are you sitting down at Dunkin' Donuts having your meeting? Mm -hmm. That's all I got. I mean, Thank you, Quinn. Um, we're going to, Handle just two or three more questions that I have for the panel, and we'll open it up for everyone. Uh, I wanted to ask both of you if you could see one key reform in the state records or meetings clause right now. What would it be? And I'll, I'll lead by sharing mine. And that is, for the past ten or twelve years, bills have been consistently introduced in the General Assembly that would require closed meetings of government boards to be recorded. Now, this was met with some resistance by some particularly small local governments that it, it, would, it would have an expense. They would need a tape recorder. Uh, arguably not the largest expense, but several counties banded together. And it effectively quashed the initiative for about a dozen years. It, that bill never gets out of committee. But I imagine that if that tape recorder was running in these closed meetings with the prospect of an actual transcript one day being released, some of these meetings might be conducted differently in a more transparent fashion and sometimes in a more legal fashion. I don't have high hopes for that bill to leap its hurdles, but that would be my dream bill. How about you two? Well, I'll take that up. Um, if you gave me a you know, pie in the sky, what, John, what would you change in North Carolina as far as uh, open government? My response, and this, this is a, probably a hot drink, um, but my response is, gets at the, the problem that Quentin was just talking about. How when you reach that point where somebody's not giving you the information that you may be within the law to get, um, you don't have, the only recourse you have is to go to court. Uh, we have this mediation process that's been set up, but that still involves the initiating some, some court uh, proceedings. And when I hear from citizens all across the state, that, you know, they said, well, I've, I've, I hear, I'll use the town of Indian Trail as an example, because it's not much of North Carolina, so I'm not going to offend anybody, and I hear about the Indian Trail about at least once every other week. Um, <laughs> the, you know, so when I get a citizen from Indian Trail, they say, I've been asking for this document for 10 years. We literally have a document that they've been asking for for 10 years. I finally got it to the forum. Um, but, uh, you know, when they say, I've been asking for this document for 10 years, and I repeatedly say, you know, we're in the same spot we've been for the last, you know, 10 months. You need to talk to an attorney. And I'm an attorney, but I can't represent you. I can't go to court on your back. And that's a huge problem in our system. Other states have a um, public access council of some kind. Uh, sometimes it's part of the attorney general's office. Sometimes it's an independent. Uh, Virginia has a sort of a board of freedom of information council um, that, that gets together. Um, and when I said council a minute ago, I was thinking COU and CIL, but council COU and SEL, an attorney whose job is to uh, immediate these disputes. And I think we need something like that in North Carolina that makes it easier for that average citizen who's having a, uh, you know, who's, who's, in, who's come into dispute with their uh, local government to be able to get some clarity, uh, short of having to ask a superior court judge uh, to, um, to help them out. I'm going to jump a little bit. Um, when you do a weekly newspaper, your jack of all trades, I cover the university when I can. And boy, they're right for coverage. They're a big, big presence in this county, and they're very, hard to go and there's no one else. So here's what I would like. Universities in North Carolina are now moving away from the downrooms where if you give them money, it's 
goes directly to the university, therefore it's public record. You can track them on, you can see what the university does with it, you can, you know, where does it go? Now they're setting up foundations, SCC has one too, it's a nonprofit. The only thing you can do is look at the tax forms, which don't have all the information you want. And you can't track where they're investing your money, so you don't know if these are ethical investments or are we talking investing in fracking companies and the people would like to know that, whether it's good or bad, that's, that's you know, you just have to figure that out for yourself. But they're, they're cloaking the money at universities, and then Western's not the only one, it's the UNC system by forming these nonprofits. And you just cannot, absolutely cannot track the information that they're doing it as a proprietary information. So that would be my dream is for transparency at the higher education level in the UNC system. Can I tell people? Yes, please. So uh, you better hope the folks at Western, and I, I maybe I shouldn't even say this out loud, uh, you better hope the folks at Western don't talk with folks at Chapel Hill because <laughs> they've decided that uh, uh, not only is that foundation not subject to the public records law, but they've also signed that it's not subject to the IRS's Form 990, which you're talking about. And so we have a two plus billion dollar down. I don't know how big it is, because the last time they filed a 990 was in 2007, when it was two billion dollars. Uh, we have a two plus billion dollar down uh, that's supposed to serve the public in North Carolina, and we have no idea what's happening with it. Mm -hmm. We don't, we don't know where your money that you donate to the university, which and where it's being invested because it goes into mutual funds and it's, it's not deliberately hidden, but it's not made clear. So you just don't know if that your money that you're donating is going into something that you would support and you have no way to find out anymore. None. Well, as you can tell, uh, we could tell you our sob stories all day uh, <laughs> about lack of transparency. But I wanted to end this part of our panel discussion on a high note which is to say I think each of us could probably also come up with some examples of a very positive development, trend, or practice in local government when it comes to transparency. I just wanted to name one myself, and perhaps you could each do so as well. I'm going to steal one from your part of the state, um, and that is the city of Greensboro has a <laughs> Took it right out from under you, probably. All right, don't worry about it. The city of I love, I love about Green, Greensboro has enacted a wonderful public records request system that is online. And this system catalogs when your request was made, how long they've been taking to fulfill your request, and then once the request for information is fulfilled, that information appears there for all the public to see. It's a real-time tracking of actual requests that are out there. And what a tool for a community. Because if I file a records request in my county, I have no way of knowing if anyone else is filing the same request. I don't know how long the queue is in front of me. In Greensboro, they know that now. And I think it's a great uh, development that a lot of local governments would do well to uh, replicate. I have no idea how costly it is, but it looks like it's run pretty efficiently. Well, I can, uh, <laughs> I can come up with another example, but I can also fill in some of the gaps on the street for um, in fact, we just we just had them yesterday come talk at Sunshine Day uh, in Durham to tell uh, most of the people Sunshine Day work for cities across the state to tell them how they did it, and it's an awesome story. Uh, it was done entirely in house. Their IT people figured this out. They said they they said we've got a problem. We will write the program. They didn't go spend millions of dollars asking some software developer to create this thing for them. They figured it out on their own. Uh, it doesn't cost them a lot of money. It's basically. Um, the, the system is fairly low tech as far as I understand, I'm not an IT guy. Um, the cost is they have one em extra employee that they hire whose job is to be the public records administrator. So she manages the system, she's also the person, she's the point person for any public records request. This is a commitment to getting information to the public uh, by saying, not, not saying this is an extra duty that we're putting on our clerk, or we're putting on our you know, city manager or someone else, we're saying we're gonna hire this person whose sole job is to get public records to the public. And I realize a lot of smaller governments aren't going to be able to do that. But Greensboro's not that big either when you look at it in comparison to state agencies and some other things. And they turn their records around in most cases within 24 hours. I, I'm blown away since they started the system. Uh, the, their records administrator, uh, a wonderful young woman, she was talking yesterday, her goal is to get the queue to zero. And she's not quite gotten it there yet, 
but she's gotten it as low as one a couple of times, you know, and that is just, that's the way it should work, and, and so, you know, Greensboro is outstanding. Uh, so it's, uh, and, and I want everyone to hear that story. Um, you know, it, it, again, it may be too difficult, big of a system. You, you may need to be a little bigger, or a little, uh, you know, uh, a smaller government, it might not make sense. But um, if we think creatively, we can solve these problems, and that's exactly what they did in Greensboro. They thought creatively about it. The, um, my other example of a, a local government that's doing good work, or not a local government, a, a state, this is a state agency. Uh, we just gave our inaugural uh, Sunshine Award uh, for, um, uh, to a government agency for doing good work, or for a government employee for doing good work, and that was the Deputy Treasurer, Brenda Williams, who, uh, with the State um, uh, Department of Treasurer. Uh, of Treasurer. Uh, she's been there for two years. In, in her two years, um, she's in charge of the unclaimed ca cash um, mm -hmm. yeah. section, so if you ever had any money that's cheap, uh, you, you lost track of an investment account or, or a bank account or something like that, it goes to this unclaimed cash fund. Uh, in her time there, they have they uh, they, they do these great programs, they, they come out to communities all across the state uh, to interact with people, tell them about, about their program, how it works, and they have reconnected. Um, last year, they returned $59 million to North Carolina citizens. Uh, that was a, a, a nearly 20% increase over the year before. And so they are doing their work within their field to make sure the public knows what, um, what they're doing. Well, I'm going to plug my commissioners again and they're going to get all the existing on the next week. We're all going to be in a great big fight. <laughs> it's not easy. I've covered boards for a long time. It's not easy to sit up there and just take it. And this board has, and I've seen it. Now, my, there's four towns in this county, which is incredible. There's four towns and a county commissioner and school board. And every one of those boards lets the public speak for an allotted amount of time, and, and only rarely have I seen people in government positions kind of lose it when they're hearing terrible things, terrible things to some people. You're a cook, you're a, you know, just vile accusations, and they sit there, and 90% of the time, there's, there's, there are, there's one exception, but everyone gets pushed, and that, they're, you know, you're tempted to push, and they sit there, and they're polite, and they, don't try to not have a public session or anything. They've sat there and kept it open in some very difficult situations. I admire that. I mean, I truly do. Most of the people who run the public office, they have good intentions. I mean, sometimes things kind of go askew, but they're doing it because they love their communities and they want to help their communities. And in my 20-some years, I have covered only one board member that I really thought was dishonest and was in it because he thought we could make money all the county commission position. One. One out of all those boards. So that's all I've got. I just all right. Want to... Thank you. And on that relatively positive note, we've got about 20 minutes left. Um, so please, we'd love to hear any questions or comments. Yes? Um, I want to make a comment. I'm one of the commissioners that Quentin was talking about. And um, I've been a commissioner for two years. You know, Jack Damon, who was there for four years. And I try to maintain in my mind one thing that Jack said to me, which was, I can listen to anything for three minutes twice a month. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that's always true. <laughs> well, I'm not so sure. Plenty of bell when I talk to these public public officials the last 30 some years. And I think Jack might have borrowed that. <laughs> I'm tired of making up stories, but, yeah. but that is exactly, I mean, it's right. I mean, yeah. you can listen to any abuse you get for three minutes. I kind of call it the, it's kind of like the uh, hanging, hanging King George and Effigy rule. You know what, they, when you think about what they did up in Boston Tea Party, oh man, they, they were rough and rough there and they eating the Tea Party. Three minutes is nothing. But, but anyway, I have a question for you. Yes. Uh, and that is, you mentioned, and I think it's a really big problem, I agree, about how do you get people in Raleigh or other state government agencies around wherever to pay attention when you're a small newspaper. And you mentioned also, somebody mentioned about the role of the Carolina Public Press, the role of your organization, you know, the, the, the folks who are advocating for other government. Do they have a role to play in helping you get 
to that point? Could you call up the Carolina Public Press, for example, and say, you know, I'm having a heck of a time with the Wildlife Commission. And because you are a bigger group, and you have a little more clout, and you can, you know, get a little, maybe, I mean, I don't know. I'm just what I'm asking. Well, question. I can and I do because I'm working with most of these people. A lot of these people have been working with them for years. Andy and I mm -hmm. traded jobs, kind of. So, mm -hmm. um, I would call Angie, and you know, I have no problem. As a matter of fact, I called a friend of mine who now works, a passion citizen is now in the effort to save money, which is a whole other story, which is horrible, is now sharing reports with Greenville, South Carolina, which makes a lot of sense because those are two different states. So I called a friend of mine who's the environmental reporter, and I said, would you file the exact same public request that I filed? The exact same one, same wording, just change national citizen times, Greenville views. And we do know each other, but not always. We're also competitors. But and you run into that, you know, do you compete? Do you help? Do you whatever? And I have a different flaw. I mean, I just kind of go and compare to the paper and I, you know, so I don't have that kind of this is my newspaper and you know, I don't you in my community. But yes and no. In short, yes and no. Yeah, I'll say um, sort of along the same point. Uh, what we're seeing in Raleigh, at least, is the media, media that, you know, 15 or 10 years ago, 15 years ago, you know, fight tooth and nail over an exclusive story, are banding together to, to pay for the lawyers. Um, <laughs> yeah, are, are banding together. We're seeing, uh, or really what it is, there's a handful of lawyers who represent all the different media companies. They all start to hear the same things. So the lawyers get together and say, okay, well, we put a coalition together. And, um, and and attack it that way, and that might be something that needs to happen up here in Western North Carolina. I don't. It would um, be very difficult. It would be very difficult. I, I promise you, it, it, it's a, it was a difficult day that the News and Observer and WRL got together and decided to to join in litigation. So it can be overcome. Um, the uh, but I but I respect it too. I absolutely respect it. Very can I, I'll follow on that point. We had a unique case in Buncombe County a few years ago where the media did just this and banded together. Briefly, what occurred was uh, a, a lot of evidence started to go missing from our police department's holdings. Drugs, guns, and money, the proverbial three things that disappear from the evidence room. And consequently, our city commissioned an audit, a $175,000 audit of what might be missing from this evidence room. Once that was completed by a forensics firm, the audit went to the district attorney, not to the city. The city didn't ask for it, decided to wait it out. And uh, we really wanted to know what was missing from the evidence. And we were a relatively young organization at the time, but we were also very open to collaboration. We are a nonprofit, we're not competing for ad dollars. Uh, our main mission is public service. And in that spirit, we were able to get a very strong coalition of our ABC TV station, our NPR affiliate, our weekly newspaper, our daily newspaper, and ourselves to join forces and hire one of the best media attorneys in the state and went into court and wiped the floor with the uh, opposition, in my humble opinion. And the judge summarily dismissed our complaints. <laughs> Which is just to say that our, our legal challenge failed utterly. Except for this, we won in the court of public opinion. We kept that issue on the front pages for the better part of a year. We made people take a stand on whether or not this was a public record, and if not, why not. And we, we stayed on the case until eventually the evidence room manager went to federal prison. We went down and got all 4,000 pages of the audit, digitized it all, put it all online, took a paper copy to the library, now it's out there for everyone. And uh, despite our failure in the legal process, I think we can all say we're glad we did it. And it's going to help foster additional collaborations down the line. We're kind of on a team now, hopefully, when it comes to open government issues. Any other questions or comments? Yes. If you don't mind, in light of what's going on at the federal level with the emails, yes. have you guys experienced any difficulties with social media or email uh, transparency? It's a great question, and it, it kind of strikes a chord with something Jonathan and Quentin was mentioning as well. We've had so many conversations, I forget who said what. 
But within the past two years in North Carolina, state agencies in particular have said that if we have to do extensive searches, we're going to start charging fees. Uh, we had a high-profile case in Asheville of an abortion clinic that was suspended by the state inspectors at the very height of the abortion policy debate in Raleigh, and they were passing that new law. We wanted to know what compelled the state agency to do that suspension and investigation right at that point. So we asked for all the Department of Health and Human Services emails regarding the case. They chewed on it for a while and came back to us and said, that's probably going to cost four or five hours of staff time, and our IT staff gets paid $45 an hour. Your bill is going to be something like $200. Uh, we hemmed and hawed a little bit, but ultimately we paid it because we thought it was going to be important information. And we got tens of thousands of emails and forewords and copies and what have you, a lot of redundancies. But we got a lot of records out of it. We can't afford to do that very often. Some outlets can't afford to do it. And that was predominantly an email search. We also asked for paper memos and what have you, but they virtually did not exist. Uh, we have a little bit more success, say, with Asheville. We ask for city council members' records, our emails on a topic. We can often get those. It takes a while, but we're not charged for them. So there's some variety there. I do hear from people who run into, you know, city councilman so-and-so is using a personal email uh, to conduct city business. You know, what does that mean? Uh, which is what I think what you're getting at with the, the, the issue of Hillary Clinton in federal level. Um, the, uh, that is a public record. Uh, if you're using it you, for, the, for, the, for the government officials who are in the room, if you're using personal email, it is a public record. Uh, if you're using your personal email for, for public business, good idea to, to just go ahead and uh, you can do it one of two ways. CC your government account, or better to just use your government account. Um, but if you CC your government account, then it's, uh, you'll be, it'll be searchable by someone later on. The, um, if, if we do run into it, absolutely. Uh, it's not been a huge problem. I think a lot of uh, government officials across North Carolina learned from uh, Governor Easley. He, uh, <laughs> uh, he was doing that. When I do these public presentations, I usually have a, uh, a PDF of a poster of uh, uh, Nick Danger fire chats. Uh, 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 because it was this detective story that was a play that apparently um, that Governor Easley really liked. And so his per, his personal email was Nick Danger spelled backwards. Um, <laughs> and that's a. Uh, um, um, yeah, it's a, uh, but that became a big public issue. That became, that became public when we were having uh, it is seven years ago now. But there was a lawsuit over how his administration was handling email, and that um, and during that lawsuit, it turned out that one of the uh, one of his staffers is testifying in the middle of the lawsuit and mentions the McDanger email, and everyone's like, "Whoa, what's that?" You know, um, so it definitely happens. The, our state's response to the Governor Easley situation, Governor Purdue uh, issued an executive order that said um, the emails are supposed to be, uh, at least for state agencies, are supposed to be CC'd if you're using a personal account. Um, we also spent a lot of money on purchasing this Mimosa system that was uh, supposed to make archiving email better and more easily searchable and fix the problem that, that, that John's talking about, about the difficulty getting email and the cost associated. Somehow, now, the most that we hear is the problem. Uh, when we ask for emails, we hear, what's it cost? <coughs> Pulling the emails off the most, it takes so long, and we have to go through each one individually. And because a, a lawyer has to look at every single one and make sure that doesn't fall within one of the 100 plus exemptions to the public records law, you know, th this is gonna cost us a fortune. And so, uh, there's a lot of ways to solve that problem. We can train our government employees on the front end to flag their emails if they think it's public or if, it, if they think it falls into an exemption, then the ones that, then they'll have to look at the ones that have been flagged and the ones that haven't been flagged are default public. You know, that's a simple solution when we train people on the front end. I know it's not simple to train all the government employees in the state on a particular issue, but that's a fix that we've talked, those of us on the transparency side have talked with um, government agencies about. Is that what Greensboro did? No, Greensboro is still doing it the other way where they're searching through them, but they, um, because they've gotten so efficient on everything else, they're not having a lot of problem with the email. And so, um, it, it does take time to get a, an email request back from Greensboro, but, um, but it doesn't take nearly as long as it, it takes from other agencies. Go ahead. 
you have a question? No, it, it had taken me 37 years to train her to read my mind. <laughs> uh, it, it's it's good. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> so when we were talking about a long time, how long is the longest time that you waited for a public record? How long is the longest time you've waited for a public record? Well, you can not get them. <laughs> I mean, that's 11 years and I'm sorry that one. Why you're not getting it or not? Well, it depends. I mean, you know, honestly, Warren, what, Warren has a good things coming to my Adam every day. And I have a system to try to keep up with my public records request. But in reality, sometimes I just find myself moving on and then I think, oh my God, that, I haven't heard from this agency since January and I haven't harassed anybody. And then I'll try to remember to harass them. As a matter of fact, SCC, we have the spokesman back here on Pickle Lamp, they have a little lead problem on some county land. And until I saw my SCC guy sitting back there, I've kind of forgotten that. <laughs> 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 you know, it's, it's ridiculous. You just do the best you can. You get some, you let some go, you coach your bosses. You know, it's, and I'll let you know real quick, one, and I'm going to give away my greatest slogan before the I haven't requested emails with it, and I'll tell you why. If I ever feel like I'm being messed with as a reporter, I'll demand every cell phone number, every single email, every single, single office communication, and these people know that. I mean, they know how irritated. <laughs> so, so I actually, they'll do their job, I'll do my job, and we'll not have an adversarial <coughs> But the public records thing, it's just a nightmare. And anyone that tells you they're just right on top of it, and they've got, they've got 50 requests up there, and they know what FOIA they have, and they know which, it's, it's difficult to keep up with. Y'all have a system, I know. I finally built a system pretty recently, and it's, it's basically a spreadsheet. It doesn't resolve all these things. <coughs> But it, it does help me track, um, it to, to answer your question, Katarina, my longest request was a series of requests to the FBI through the Freedom of Information Act. And it took just shy of five years to get the records I was after. I, I was very um, insistent and consistent in checking in on them. And consequently, I got thousands of pages of records that I needed that were from the 1960s and formerly classified. So. By being tenacious, I was able to get them, but it was a slow process. Alternatively, if I, if I look at my spreadsheet at a very simple request I made about 13 months ago to the FAA, I wanted to know which entities in North Carolina are authorized to use drones. Right now, there's, there's probably about five. There are research uh, applications at universities, NC State, uh, state transportation division has a program that's researching for the future when everyone's going to have drones. So it's probably five certificates of authorizations, as they're called. I've been waiting 13 months for those five pages. I have called them probably 10 times. I've been in email correspondence with three different public information officers. No, they signed me a tracking record early on. No one seems to know what's going on with it. A month ago, they said they need two more weeks. I still don't have the records, but I'll stay on the case, and hopefully I'll have the records before they're relevant. Five years actually not bad for that. Yeah, <laughs> you can do worse. Yeah, I, the longest I've waited for any state level is about a year. Um, it, I don't do nearly as much uh, requesting now, even though I'm a government advocate, as I did when I was a reporter, um, and, and that was when I was working as a reporter. Uh, I'm aware of open records requests in our state uh, of up to 20 months. Uh, with our governor's office, the, um, the uh, governor's office has um, been fairly slow for about uh, 20 months. Maybe that's not even late. Um, with responding to records requests, and these are I, I'm, uh, one of the ones I'm aware of is an out-of-state reporter never even gotten an acknowledgement that uh, they have this request and just won't return his calls. And, that's, uh, and you, you, you don't have to North Carolina. You don't have to be a state resident in order to. Um, Make a record request. Any person. Anyone else? Got a few more minutes left. Yes, Mark. Yeah, um, my name is Mark Goldstein, and I'm on the board of Carolina Public Press, and I'm a um, very amateur data geek. 
And um, I had a question. I think this is probably probably mostly for um, for Clinton. Um, is I'm wondering, kind of my pet thing is um, data indexes that government has, and I'm wondering if you've ever done um, a data index request, and if so, what sort of reception you've gotten or response you've gotten. I've not that. done that as a weekly newspaper reporter or since I moved back to the At National Citizen Times, we had people that could work that, work with that. That's, I can do some, I can do Excel spreadsheet, but it's not really useful to me because I'm not particularly agile with it. I think it's a wonderful thing, but I mean, I, one thing I've read that's very interesting is to request what data they keep as a public, you know, as a public record, find out, actually make that request to find out how they keep it in the public record form. Um, but to answer your question, these guys probably do more of that than I do. My requests are simple, you know, it's just basic, basic stuff, basically. I, I help a lot of people with data uh, requests. I don't actually, you know, manipulate the data. I'm not, I'm probably like pointing up. I can do some basic spreadsheet work, but, um, but what you're asking about, I, I don't know if everybody ever knows what that is, is the public records law says that uh, every government uh, agency in the state that keeps a database has to keep an index of the database that gives the fields uh, which, in which the data is stored and uh, gives a, a sort of a, a basic description of what's in the database. And so that's a really valuable tool for people who are seeking data because then you can, you can you know, find out what for it's in and, and what's going to be in there, what fields are going to be in there, and so you, you can know what to look for. Um, you know, the requesting for uh, databases uh, is uh, really sort of all over the map. Some agencies are uh, amazing, uh, you know, get it. Um, I mean, the city of Raleigh has a data portal where you can just plug in and, and, and start downloading the data that you want. Um, and, and other cities are working on it. I think that, I think these folks in Asheville are working on something similar. The, uh, and, and then you have some agencies that when you ask for that data index, they look at you like you've got three eyes. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's just all over. Yeah, I did it once for Asheville and Buncombe. I got Asheville in three days, and Buncombe it took me, I think, seven or eight months or more to get it, and several visits. And well, and sometimes we forget that the small governments that they do have other jobs. I mean, I do, I've got to jump into some defense here because they actually have a job, and it's not that. I mean, this is, they, and sometimes the, the vesicles don't feel this way, but you get people who see us as a, added burden. And in a way, we are. I mean, they forget who they work for, and we forget they have a job. And, and some of them are really strapped. I don't know about the county, but some, I know some of the data people here would have a very, I mean, they've tried to work with me on certain things, but they have a hard time putting me in. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm patient about that. It was the five or six months of, why do you want to Oh, I'm, I'm with you. <laughs> I mean, I'm with you. It, it makes me angry, and I have to sit back and breathe and say, I'm not a priority, but I wish I was, you know, really <laughs> I have to say, I'm sorry, but I can't let something that you said hang there. One of the things I, we fight against all the time is this attitude that this is an added burden. Uh, government transparency should be seen as part of doing business. And so and I, don't, I don't think that's exactly what you meant, but that's sort of the way I heard it. And, and, you know, we need uh, the attitude in our state to be this is part of the cost of doing business. This isn't an extra uh, that, that, that we're spending money on. Uh, we're seeing it right now at the University of North Carolina. They have this. Uh, I'm sorry, I always pick on it. Uh, usually, when I do my intros, I tell them to tell that I'm a proud graduate of the university, even though, even despite its record on transparency, um, the, this, the university has a public records website that is like the polar opposite of the Green Corps website that we were talking about. Where one of the things that they do is they put up this um, estimated cost for fulfilling your request. It's not the cost they're charging you. They're trying to make you feel guilty that this is how much money that we spent on, and the, the numbers are wildly off, I can't figure out how they're, how they're doing it. Um, <coughs> it was like $7,000 to, um, to, to respond to this document that they had sent to the Southern Association of Colleges as part of the scandal that's going on. Mm -hmm. So this document exists, uh, and they're, they're, it's, it's cost $7,000 to make a copy of the document. Yeah. <laughs> you know, what, I'm sure what they're saying is it's going to cost us $7,000 in attorney's time to review every page of it and look for things that we wrongly think we should redact. Um, but that's, you know, it, so um, that can't be seen as, as uh, an added burden. It needs to be part and of it. And I'll count with that, because I agree with you, but I'll count with this. It doesn't 
her to remember these people and we're talking back and forth. And it's and I know you don't mean that, but these it doesn't always have to be adversarial. It just doesn't. It this we're all in this together. We're all in a good community. It does not have to be a great big fight. It can be. It can be. I don't mind a fight. I mean, I, I like a good fight. And I've had some fights in Jackson County. Not with my nice commission. <laughs> but when you pick up the phone and you ask for something, you know, they, you're, they're human being on your side. And they have all the pressures that are coming with that. And you don't know on a given day, you know, if the baby has a flu, their thoughts just snapped at them. And it just, I mean, I don't know, maybe I'm gotten soft. <laughs> I don't know. I just, I just, I agree yeah, I just don't, I, agree I just try really hard to not make it adversarial until it is. And then I'm really okay. I mean, I'm really honest. Then it's fun. It's fun. Bobby has a question. Yes, Bobby. What's your recourse if you're thrown out of a meeting that you think should be public? Are you asking me or are you asking me? I'm asking everybody. I'm going to defer to Jonathan on that. So, um, you know, if you, if you stay, you're at risk of being, you know, charged with trespass. Um, they, if, if, they're, if they've closed the meeting. Now, if you think that the meeting has been closed improperly, you have a, a, the opportunity to challenge that in the court system. And, um, and if it was closed improperly, then there are uh, a couple of penalties that can come. That can come. One, uh, so the one with real teeth is that any action that is a result of that closed meeting can be invalidated by the court. And the, what, if the agency, if the board um, uh, didn't consult their attorney, they weren't, they weren't relying on attorney's advice to close this meeting, then the board members can be held individually liable for your attorney's fees. And so um, that's the one with teeth. It's not a lot of teeth, but it's the one with teeth. The other one, you can get an injunction from the court ordering them not to do this again. And so that's uh, you know, sort of a slap on the wrist, but, but they do run a risk if they violate that injunction of, of more severe penalties in the court. And with that, I regret to say we're pretty much out of time. That said, our door is always open to you. Um, come see us at carolinapublicpress.org. All our contact info is there. We'd love to hear your story ideas. We'd love to hear your thoughts about what we're doing well and what we're not doing well, where the gaps are. And I'm pleased to announce that in conjunction with all the public records work we already do, we are launching a new WNC-wide transparency project called Open WNC, whereby we'll be doing everything in our power to help local governments uh, meet the best practices of transparency in the region. And we're really excited about it because we think it's a value of transparency uh, that can have some real value to our democracy, to our economies, uh, and, and to our, our rights to know what's done uh, as public business. So look for that project in the coming months as we develop it. And thanks very much to our panelists for having us and to our hosts, and again to all our donors, supporters, and readers. Thank you.